video, we're going to be digging into Nehemiah chapter 5, and I called the sermon I preached on this section, Fighting Danger with Fear. I do encourage you just to take some time to read through Nehemiah chapter 5 a couple of times yourself. Uh, just try and notice some key repetition and some of the big themes that jump out of this part of the story. And spend some time praying and asking God to open your eyes to see wonderful truths about Him and how to live in the light of who He is and what He's done. In story like this, um, I often find the narrative plot arc to be a useful tool just to see the structure of a story. And I think that's uh, particularly helpful in this section uh, where we're given our setting, five verse or one particularly, where we see the internal danger coming to light as some Jews cry out against their fellow Jews here in verse 1, and that sets the scene. We've seen in chapter 4 the opposition coming from outside of Jerusalem with Sanballat and his buddies coming to oppose the work that they're doing. But here it is internal danger that arises, and in many ways it's even more dangerous than the external opposition that they faced. Then we see the conflict, 5 verse 2, all the way through to verse 8. Uh, so this section. And in this conflict, the, the problem is that the poorer Jews are starving because the richer Jews are exploiting them, which was actually against the Jewish law, which Nehemiah is going to highlight to them. The climax of the story verses 9 to 11, where Nehemiah calls them to repent and to live in the fear of God. And that little phrase, fear of God, I think is one of the, the most important uh, little phrases in this section of the story, where he says, shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God? That is a very important theme in Nehemiah as a whole, uh, and in God's word as a whole, actually. And from that point, we see the resolution from chapter 5, verse 12 to 19. Uh, we see, thankfully, a favorable response. And then uh, Nehemiah is shown as a model of generosity, um, showing it, it flows from his fear of God. He shows us uh, what it looks like uh, to treat our, the family of God rightly as you do the work of God. And then the new setting comes in the next chapter, uh, where we see the enemies from outside start to attack again. Um, and just seeing that kind of structure in the story helps uh, to see the, the big idea. And with the um, climax coming here in verse 9 to 11, with the focus on the, shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God? With that being the, the climactic moment, that focuses in your, your emphasis of the passage and how you're going to teach it. And so we see that those who live in the fear of God show it by the way they treat the family of God as they work for the glory of God. Another useful tool is just looking for the different characters in the story. Uh, so we've got the men and the people as a key character in the story. The accusations come against their fellow Jews, who are another important character in the story. And then Nehemiah himself. So the character tool um, is always worth looking out for uh, in narratives like this. And then the most important character in the story is the Lord God, um, where he says, fear our God is, is the vital focal point. He says, may God shake out those who don't respond rightly. The people respond by praising the Lord. We see Nehemiah as one who walks in the reverence of God. And it's important that that, that word is also fear. So it's the, the same word used there. And that's the same word that we saw um, back in chapter, chapter 1, verse 11, where Nehemiah is shown to be a man who 
fears God and lives uh, lives his life in awe and wonder at who God is and what he's done. And then the section ends with Nehemiah saying, Remember me, my God, with favor for all I've done for these people. And what Nehemiah is saying here is that only God's approval matters. He, he is somebody who, who wants to live rightly in God's world for God's glory. And that shows by the way that he does the work of God and by the way that he treats the people of God. In the first part of the story, we see that the problem is they're not getting enough grain. So because the people are inside the city of Jerusalem, um, the men are all working on the walls. They aren't now working the fields. So the, the women, their wives and their sons and daughters are now starving. They don't have enough food to eat. And the big problem is that the rich Jews, their fellow Jews, are charging interest. Nehemiah says it here, you are charging your own people interest. He says, let's stop charging interest. Give back everything you've taken. Don't charge any more interest. And the, the context, the Old Testament um, context for this uh, was that this was against the Jewish law. Uh, if you look at Exodus 22 verse 25 or Leviticus So in their law, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, all speak uh, about the fact that they shouldn't charge interest. Actually, they should give, um, they should support the the poorer among them. Um, Psalm 15 uh, also gives us uh, important context, especially verse 5, um, about charging of interest. And then the prophets also speak about it. Uh, If you look at Ezekiel uh, 18, In a number of verses in Ezekiel 18, he speaks against the charging of interest. So God's people, uh, their own fellow Jews, have been charging interest, and this was against the law. Now what we'll see in Nehemiah chapter 8 is that the people didn't, they hadn't been well taught. When we see the law being read in chapter 8, the people are cut to the heart and realize that they haven't been living God's way. And so this is one of those situations. Uh, the Jews, it was a difficult time, there was a famine in the land, so the rich Jews were probably doing what they thought was right and normal. They charging interest just so that they can make a little bit more during a difficult time. But what it meant was that their, their fellow Jews weren't getting grain, they weren't getting enough to eat and stay alive. But worse than that, they didn't even realize that they were going against God's law. And actually it was Uh, Things like this that the prophets spoke against that had got them into trouble in the first place. And so when we get to this climactic moment, Nehemiah says, shouldn't you walk in the fear of God? So he doesn't say, he doesn't start by saying, stop charging interest. He doesn't start by saying, you're not loving your brothers, now you need to love them more. He starts by saying, walk in the fear of God. That's where it starts. It starts by a right understanding of who God is and how to live in the light of him. And because they weren't uh, walking in the fear of God, their Gentile enemies were laughing at them. And God's glory was meant to be on display through his people as they lived his way in his world. But that wasn't happening. But thankfully we get this uh, wonderful response by the people in verse 12 where they say, we will give it back. They respond rightly. Nehemiah then he calls the priests in and makes them make a promise to keep the promise that they have made. Um, and these ideas, God shaking out the people, is also uh, an Old Testament idea. In Exodus 14 verse 27, the same kind of language is used regarding how the Lord dealt with the Egyptians. And we see this also interestingly in Um, Acts in the New Testament um, where Paul does this against the Jews in Corinth and Nehemiah is saying God will shake you out of his house if you don't live if you don't keep the promises that you're making at this point from verse 14 onwards we see Nehemiah holds himself up as an example of of what it means to live in the fear of God and that's why we see he says out of reverence for God 
Um, how did he respond? Well, he devoted himself to the work of God and he looked after the people of God. Uh, we're told for the first time um, in the book that he was actually the governor of the land of Judah and he was governor for 12 years. So back in chapter 2 when King Artaxerxes had asked him how long do you need to go for, we weren't actually given an answer there but it seems like Nehemiah said I need to go for as long as it takes and so he went for 12 years and he was the exact opposite of the earlier governors who had placed a heavy burden on the people. Rather, he says, out of reverence for God, he devoted himself to the work and he looked after the people. He actually fed the people of the land. If you do the sums, we're told 150 Jews came and ate at his table every day for 12 years. That's hundreds of thousands of Jews and officials and people from the surrounding nations, so foreigners, who are coming and sitting at his table. And what Nehemiah is doing here is he is showing what it means to be somebody who lives in the fear of God. As you do the work of God, you are loving to the family of God. So the people may not have realized what great danger they were in, and that's why Nehemiah took this so seriously. Uh, the original readers may have picked up this uh, from verse 1, where this great outcry is the same kind of language used um, in Exodus uh, 2 and 3, um, about uh, God's people in the land of Egypt. It's used even earlier than that in uh, Genesis uh, 18 and 19, uh, talking about uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and the outcry that went up to the Lord against them. Uh, so it was a very big danger that the people were in. But Nehemiah tells them to fight this danger with fear. Fear God respond or remember who God is and we've that's been a, a repeated idea remember God remember what he's done and live in the light of that and that's what he's calling them to do in this section and that's the same that is true for us still today if you go and look at 1 Peter uh, chapter 1 from verse 17 onwards uh, you see that as God's people we're also called to live in the fear of God remembering what he's done for us in Christ. And then that leads to what we see in verse 22, a deep love for one another. So we need to remember that living in the fear of God will be seen by the way that we treat the family of God as we do the work of God. And I think that's worth digging into in with those you teach and um, thinking about what is it going to look like to treat the family of God rightly as we continue with the work that God has given us to do for his glory. We should be known, as Jesus said, it's by your love for one another that the world will know that you are my disciples. And so we need to work really hard at loving one another. And the way we do that is by fearing God. The more we realize who God is and how much he has loved us, it should then cause us to be a people like Nehemiah, who worked hard at God's work and loved the people of God for God's glory. And that's why he says, remember me with favor, my God, for all I've done for these people. Because Nehemiah knew that only God's approval matters. And thankfully, thankfully for us, God's approval is what we have because of Jesus. And flowing from that reality, we should be a people who continue with the work of God, loving the people of God as we live for the glory of God. Well, God bless as you dig in further.